Okay, a new paper was just released here on April 6th that shows that there was an ancient race war that was found in Egypt. Now, they've discovered an ancient burial ground that's there, and it uh, contains uh, an ancient race war that looks like it was between the ancient proto-Negroids that ended up becoming the Nubians versus the endemic Caucasians that were uh, around the Nile at the time. And it shows the burial ground that they had. This is right here. What you see is uh, one of the skulls that are from there, and you can see its spade-shaped nostril into it, its sallow eyes, very big brow ridge too, but also the large prognostic jaw and thing that goes along with it. And this indicates this is one of the Negroids that are uh, of the group that are there. I'm sorry, it came out on April 4th. 13,000-year-old uh, uh, Saharan remains tell of first known Homo sapiens war in Africa. In 2014, a fresh analysis on a set of human remains dating back to 13,000 years, which were found on the east bank of the Nile in, uh, in northern Sudan, suggests the individuals were victims of an intergroup war, according to a report in the Independent. The finding provided evidence for what was the oldest known relative large-scale human armed conflict. The ancient remains were originally unearthed in 1964 by the prominent American archaeologist Fred Windorf from a prehistoric cemetery loaded, uh, located in now what is Jebel Sahaba in Sudan. The UNESCO-funded excavations took place to investigate archaeological sites that were about to be inundated by the Aswan High Dam whenever they set up the Aswan Dam and inundated and basically back flooded the Nile in that area. They wanted to get as much as they possibly could and had found this. Uh, the discovery of the cemetery was of immense significance as it is the oldest burial ground ever found in the Nile Ver uh, Valley area and one of the very first um, war cemeteries in the history of all of mankind. However, when a similar scene of massacre was found at Nataruk near Lake Turkana, Kenya, also the area where the oldest tools in the world were found, where 27 skeletons were found with blades embedded in bones, fractured skulls, and other injuries, according to a conversational article, this claim was challenged on the grounds of uncertain dating. It is also claimed that as the remains at Jebel Sahaba were found in a cemetery, this would indicate some type of settled society, at least giving the Naturic site the legitimate claim to being the earliest known warring hunter-gatherers or primitive people. The archaeological conclusions were inconclusive, inconclusive but if the age of 13,000 years is accepted, Jebel Sahaba Cemetery is the oldest evidence of warring Homo sapiens. And I believe I did an article on this at the end of last year here, not too long ago, and that they had pegged it down using uh, fluoroscopy and all the new uh, type of dating systems they could, and they pulled it out to being 9100 BC, give or take 150 years, uh, was the play on it either side. And so 9100 BC, which would have been about... Uh, uh, 11,100 years ago, not actually 12, so it pulls the date down a little bit. And uh, also it notes that those are proto-Negroids, they're not a modern Negroid. It would have been something very much more like a Homo erectus type or something like that, and not quite what we see as the modern Homo sapiens version uh, that we see in, in uh, Nubia, in Nubians to this day. Now the Jebel Sahaba find is uh, 61 men women and children were recovered from the Sahaba and sent to the British Museum for safekeeping. A team of French scientists from Bordeaux University worked in collaboration with the British Museum to examine dozens of the skeletons. Their analysis revealed numerous arrow impact marks and flint arrowhead fragments on the bones of the victims, suggesting that the majority of the victims were killed by enemy archers. According to the British Museum, 45% of the people in the cemetery died through violence. Furthermore, the research demonstrated that the attacks took place over many months or years, hence indicating a war or a long-term conflict, or a repeated conflict over and over again in the same area. Skeletal remains of two adult men were buried together in a shallow grave, and the remains of the actual weapons that killed them are displayed in their original locations. Over 20 weapon fragments and cuts were, marks were found with two flakes still lodged in the pelvis bone of the burials 
and here we see a picture of that right here and you can see the pencils and they're outlining all the flint pieces and the arrowheads that were stuck into their bodies uh, you can almost just see that one right right here sitting there an arrowhead sitting there and uh, one right there but man it's probably difficult in y'all's shot there to see it and that they had been laid and burialed so apparently the people that killed them went ahead and buried them and uh, that'll be interesting here showing up but uh, these are two Jebel Sahaba victims on the east bank there pencils are pointing to that weapon fragments as I said parallel research conducted by John Moore's University the University of Alaska and a New Orleans Tulane University suggested that the victims were part of the general sub-Saharan populations the ancestors of modern black Africans while remains of the other group exhibited a different phenotype the North African Levantine European population group which is what shows up as Egypt and they've been found to be close to Jebel Sahaba now the different groups could be distinguished by their unique characteristics for example the sub-Saharan originating group had long limbs relative short torsos and projecting upper and lower jaws along with rounded foreheads and broad nose while the North African Levantine European originating group had shorter limbs, longer torsos, and flatter faces, and slender nasal slits. She didn't put that in there, but if you're going to compare the, the four things together, you're looking at pro prognostic jaws, bulbous foreheads, and broader spade-shaped nose holes, and you're looking at other guys that had other limb shapes, smaller, shorter limbs, but longer torsos, and flatter faces with slitter, slender or sl slender or nasal slits. During the period in which the Sub-Saharans violently perished, North Sudan was a major ethnic interface between the two groups. At the same time, there was a huge competition for resources due to severe climatic downturn in which many water sources dried up and people of all ethnic groups were forced to migrate to the banks of the Nile. Like the Green Sahara Project I had showed and it showed how they had migrated probably in two different directions. But um, not that they weren't against the top of the Mediterranean all along, but then it, they had to get closer to that and away from what ended up drying up and turning into wadis and oases and then pretty much became the desert they had to leave. Uh, researchers suggest that the different groups would have inevitably clashed under those circumstances, resulting in the violent ending of a group of sub-Saharans more than 13,000 years ago. And what they don't mention in this is that it seems like that uh, the Sub-Saharans brought clubs and blunt weapons to an arrow fight. And most of them are showing up as being Sub-Saharan, uh, especially out of the groups that are injured or showing that they have injury on their bodies and so on. So kind of unique and, and interesting. You can see the prognosis of the jaw, but it won't show you the front of it to be able to see the nasal slits and so on. So let's look at another uh, video done by a contemporary of ours, a super Egyptian, and see what... 11,000 BC on the edges of northern Sudan, Jebel Sahaba, a race war between Proto-Europeans from Egypt, part of the North African Levantine European people who lived around much of the Mediterranean basin, against the ancestors of Negroids in Sub-Saharan Black Africa, or what would be Proto-Negroids. And here we can see where it's at here in Egypt. There's a closer look at exactly where we're looking at. Apparently it was quite a vicious battle. The skeletal remains were found in an entire cemetery in 1964 by Windorf, as we had said. The two groups, although part of our species, Homo sapiens, would have looked quite different from each other and were also almost certainly different culturally and linguistically. The sub-Saharan originating group had long limbs, relatively short torsos, projecting upper and lower jaws with prognathism, along with rounded or bulbous foreheads and broad nose or nasal apertures, while the North African European originating group had shorter limbs, longer torsos, flatter faces. Both groups were very muscular and strongly built, it said. Here's a dig at one of the sites. These are French scientists working in collaboration with the British Museum. 
and they've been examining dozens of the skeletons, the majority of which appear to have been killed by archers using the flint tip bow and arrow at the time. And that's the picture I actually showed you there. It's been cropped somewhat. So this goes by so fast I'll actually try to read it to you. Under the picture there, excavation photo of the two victims of violence uh, featured in room 64, barrels 20 and 21 out of the number. Uh, the pencils point to the weapon fragments as I would showed you before. Um, now these uh, were buried together in the standard flexed position on their heads uh, to the east looking south. So this is not a normal burial that is facing to the east. So they had set them pretty much facing to where maybe they had come from or something or whatever. But a total of 19 weapon fragments were found in among the bones of the burial, 21 by the original excavators, including one still lodged in his pelvis. However, modern conservation of the bodies in preparation for the display has now made it possible to see at high magnification many more tiny chips. Ongoing research has also studied the velocity and directionality of the arrows and weapons based on cut marks and the micro traces on the bones, potentially allowing us to recreate the lethal rate itself. And these aren't long-range bows and arrows at this time. People were getting fairly close to each other and launching them into each other, things like that. The black Africans came out worse, though, it seems like, in this fight. This is the world's oldest large-scale human conflict and first race war that can be found. The discovery of dozens of these previously undetected arrow impact marks and flint arrow fragments suggested that the majority of the sub-Saharan individuals, men, women, and children in the Jebel Sahaba Cemetery were killed by Caucasian Egyptian enemy archers. The war, uh, war dead were buried by their own people. Latest research demonstrates that the attacks took place over many months or years, and it looks like it may have actually uh, been buried by the locals. That's the picture I showed you before. The cause of the conflict? Well, Dr. Friedman believed that the weather conditions of the Nile caused the outbreak of conflicts as the landscape was not of today's climate, but a baking desert and a fertile river valley, but in fact the weather was believed to be cold and dry with little fertile land. And uh, this is coming out of the last ice age, right? And so at this time it really wasn't over abundantly swathing with stuff. It was more of a icy tundra land uh, looking scape which kind of looks like it does now but it wouldn't have had so much of a desert and the temperature would not have been near as hot during this time of course and it seems like there's a large period of drought it seems like during that ice age because most of the rain and moisture seems to keep getting trapped into ice and building up more and more instead of having flood valleys and redoing it that there was a lot less rainfall during these times and stuff and so it could have been a drought type situation that drove them to the same area then again, it could have been other reasons. First-hand inspection of the dead. Well, at least 60 individuals were found examined using modern technology. One body was found with 39 pieces of flint from arrows and other flint-tipped weapons. So that seems odd because someone really can't take 39 arrows into them. It's kind of odd. But here we see one of the prognostic jaw negroids. And you can tell by the skull shape here and the very much um, extended uh, brow ridge and so on that this is uh, very much what would be a proto-negroid and you can see the large nasal aperture that's on it too at the time so not really quite the same as we would say in fact 61 men women and children were buried at Jebel Sahaba and at least 45 percent of them died to inflicted wounds making this the earliest evidence of intercommunal violence in the archaeological record Chips and flakes of chert, the remnants of arrows and other weapons were found mixed in and with some cases still embedded in the bones of 26 individuals while cut marks were found on the bones of others. Scanning electron microscope images of a weapon fragment embedded in the pelvis bone of burial 21 at Jebel Sahaba and this is the bone surface here but what this is is a piece that was stuck down into there off of it and it had broken off if you can see it. It's even been flint chipped, but then you can see that it's jabbed into there, and I guess the tip of it had broken off in there. This is scanning at quite some 20 times magnification, it says. 
<clears throat> Certainly the Northern Sahara areas were a, a major ethnic interface between these two different groups at around this period. Indeed, the remains of North African Levantine European originating population group has been found 200 miles south of Jebel Sahara, even all the way up into the Horn area. If you look at the uh, definition of Caucasian, it'll show you that it goes all the way through the Horn area. And there's been sites even found down in the Cape, such as the Hofmeyer site that's quite famous. Uh, that's way down in, into that point. So, so Jebel Sahaba, thus suggesting that the Arrow victims were slaughtered in an area where both populations had operated. And this is what they had said in the first place, but it looked like maybe one was operating in this area and the other were migrants into that area. And you find this population here, you don't find them mentioned again or found again until the earliest dynasties where they tell that they had ran into these Nubians again, right? And apparently there was a huge war there where they said that they had killed them all off. Their seed was no more. And in the records it shows they don't really talk about or refer to them all the way to like the fifth dynasty somewhere in there to the sixth it's uh, almost 500 years later before they're seen again and archaeologists have found the skeletons of these and looking at them they can tell that one is more proto than the other nubian a the first one is more proto to the other one and then nubian c is more like the nubians we see today and it seems to be an evolution that's happening during this period that they're even able to notice in that small amount from a proto-Negroid through to being the common Nubians of today, which shows something pretty interesting there. Now from the war dead and the skulls, we had uh, definite proof the Caucasian Egyptians were 200 miles south into Sudan, and they, the Caucasians, were much farther south than previously thought. But they said that they had originated from up in that area, and then Punt was supposed to have been up in there, although some people believe that it's over in Yemen and maybe as far as Sumeria. And I've shown Sumerian connections to this and stuff too, but up in the Horn area where we're talking about, the land of Punt, is pretty much where Ethiopia is today, and it is not today what were there primordially. The climatic downturn, known as the Younger Dryas period, has been preceded by much lusher, wetter, and warmer conditions, which had allowed populations to expand. But when the climatic conditions temporarily worsened during that Younger Dryas, water holes dried up, vegetation wilted, and animals died over uh, or moved to the only major year-round sources of water still available, and there was the Nile. Now, the ancient Egyptians' name for the Nile was the R, the River R. So I don't know what you'd call people that live around a major river named R, but, uh, but they don't call them the Nihilus people. That's the uh, Greek name for that. And this Younger Dryas thing that's mentioned right here is quite important. I've showed quite a few videos about it. And it seems that we had a cometary strike that hit the earth. And they've even found in Iceland another, another actual fragment of this having happened too, uh, all the way there. So it carries from there and North America destroying part of the, a part or most of the continental ice shelf at one time. And this had caused things like there are mammoths that are literally blown over on their side and they are fresh, frozen, solid, with still food in their mouth in many cases. And you wonder what had happened during that time in a, a great cataclysm. And if we're looking for something biblical, this is a time we really have to look at. If we're looking at something that mocked the biblical thing and where it came from, that had been Sumeria when it really had a giant flood system and it actually seemed to have happened repeatedly and once after they said it, it would never happen again by the gods. And so that's the reason for supposedly Abraham's having left. But then there's other things to that too. I think I've showed in a few of my videos if you go back and look at them. But uh, the Younger Dryas is extremely important uh, to what had happened to the world and it doesn't take much of an asteroid to do something like this and I still fear for it myself, a lot, a lot of this. Also, I'm worried that people are so worried about a global warming trend, they're not paying attention to the cycles of the last few ice ages and how we're kind of overdue to have gone through one. And people keep talking about global warming and it looks like we're at that maximum that peaks right before it dips. In fact, we're kind of overdue. Well, let's continue here, let's look at this. And I'll show you a few pictures of Homo erectus and things that might give a little bit of insight to the little of this too. 
Humans of all ethnic groups in the area were forced to follow suit and they migrated to the banks, especially the eastern bank of the Great River, the Nile, and other rivers around the world, competing for infinite resources or finite resources that used to be infinite. Human and groups would have inevitably clashed, running into each other, and the concurrent investigation is dis demonstrating that the apparent scale of this earliest known substantial human conflict and how it had happened at the Nile here. So Egypt again comes into focus some. Primordial Egypt. As we can witness, this is one of the war casualties. The Negroid observed the shape of the rounded nasal slit and the prognostic jaw and so on. This is, this is a Negroid, or a proto-Negroid at this point, really. The, the amount of cowling around the eyes is pretty evident in the cheekbones and the way everything looks. The skeletons were originally found during UNESCO's funding excavations carried out by the investigational archaeology sites that were about to be inundated by that Aswan High Dam I talked about before. All the Jebel Sahara material was taken by those excavators to the laboratories in Texas and some 30 years later were transferred to the care of the British Museum which uh, is now working with other scientists to carry out major new analysis onto them. Apparently they didn't get touched much here in uh, Texas and no one had too, too much interest in them. Or it just didn't come up on the list, I guess. Now the stone flakes of the weapons originally lashed into wooden handles would have decayed. And so the wood would have decayed away, of course. Look uh, they look primitive, but they were murderous weapons. Uh, Windor found hundreds, but the scans at the British Museum have revealed many more, including some which penetrated and lodged inside of skulls. Arm bone also on display shows a healed fracture, a classic defensive injury from bones raised to wards off savage blows, but it actually healed. So apparently this is people that had been in fights and left and come back again and so on after heels or fractures although that arm fracture could have been from falling down it looks to be in that same way one skeleton was radiocarbon dated in 1988 to 13,740 years before the present so that would be 11,740 BP give or take 600 years so now we're looking at 11,140 years and I think they've pegged it better than that as I said before now with the other dating where it won't have a plus and minus of 600, it gets a little closer. And so in some cases, after doing a few of them that correlate, they'll peg it to 150 years on either side. So a 300-year broad, not a 1,200-year broad on either side. Often with remains from such an ancient time, we will never know what happened to them, Friedman said. With these skeletons, there's no question we found arrowheads lodged in the spine, spear points that had pierced eye sockets, and uh, many clearly died under a hail of arrows. The lives and the deaths of these people were not nice. Boy, that flashed by so quick. Later in Egyptian history, the Egyptian Caucasians subjugated Sudan in various conquests, what they call the Nubians, and carved this into stone for eternity in their artwork. And you'll see Nubians getting captured over and over again and being subjugated. Later you'll see them paying homage, but there are such things as the Simna Stele of the III that shows you they weren't even allowed into Egypt and that they had to stop way up at He, which is above where we're talking about and actually give homage there that they weren't allowed into there but here it shows definitely negroids and the shapes of their faces along with the skulls that come from the graveyard that coincide with each other here you can see slaves being brought down south onto the ships we detect likely west eurasian gene flow into the ancestors of yoruba west africans within the last 10,000 years so in time in this time which indirectly contributed to a small amount of Neanderthal ancestry into the Yoruba. These results mean that we have not identified any Sub-Saharan African sample that we are confident has no evidence of back to African mi migration. 
Recent genetic studies focused on MTT, MT DNA, mitochondrial, suggest that two genetic lineages, the M1 and the U6M haplogroups, originated simultaneously in Western Asia about 40 to 40,000, 40 to 45,000 years ago, pardon me, and spread together with the modern humans in the Northern Africa about 40,000 years ago. These populations may represent the rootstock of the early settlers and inhabitants of the Eastern Sahara who were subsequently to people the Nile Valley and build one of the first organized civilized states, the Egyptian Pharaonic Empire. This was said by Aubrey back in 2008. But I believe the, the Horn people and then what we would call the Bedarians and Akata cultures had come together somewhat, but not together as a unified state. And what did unify all of this was the Sumerians coming in with the Shimsu Hor and the followers of Horus. But that's in a few other videos I've done. Now, Spencer Wells stated that his Eurasian, Eurasian Adams descendants traveled through sub-Saharan uh, Africa all the way. That a lot of genetics shows that there was a bottleneck up towards the north of the Nile there and that you see that it's more of a cul-de-sac and it doesn't continue. But there are, and this is indicating things like the Hofmeyer site and Blombo's Cave and stuff, where they had come all the way down through in primordial times. And so the claims of the Sub-Saharan Africans to uh, South Africa in itself are kind of a, a bogus and really under question as to what timeline we're trying to pull off when we talk about this. But also the people that are generally there now are Bantu expansion people which happened much much later and not even really the endemic Negroid types that were in that area but primarily hunter gatherers that the locals said that they didn't run into until they had been there for quite some time and started to build and then it started to become a problem eventually they built a fence and I think we know what came from that and we estimate that a migration of Western African origin into Morocco began about 40 generations ago, approximately 1,200 years ago, a migration of individuals with Nilotic ancestry into Egypt occurred about 25 generations ago, so only about 750 years ago. And this would have been the late expansion. The oldest Caucasoid skull was dated to 30,000 years, and the oldest Negroid only 14,000 years, making Negroids a recent addition and rendering Caucasians indigenous to all of North Africa. But also in Central Africa, Eastern Africa, and up through to the Horn area until much more recent times. And I believe that Negroid date has been changed to about 9,100 or what would be um, 11,100 KYA. And when we talk about Caucasoids at 30,000, the genomes, even of Cro-Magnon, are showing up to be very contemporary with modern people that exist today up in Europe and show that they're not really a, a proto at that time either, genetically in that way or cosmetically with the cranium and body forms and things like that. So Again, we're also comparing a proto with what would have been known as a modern human at that time. Homo sapiens now are considered modern human for everybody, so everybody can be on a level playing field. But now that's kind of destructive too because we find Caucasoid versions going back 315,000 BC. So to put things in comparison with what would have been just shortly before this point here. So, yeah, and uh, let's look at Homo erectus. This is what seems to have been a major contributor to the Negroid or South African version of this. And it also shows um, perhaps a slight different or variations on a theme that come out of that. Well, you just put in Homo erectus, you're going to get something that looks like this. And there's a lot of forms of them that go on. I don't want to sound weird or racist or anything like that towards anybody or hateful, but uh, you look at something like this, and I don't know what comes to mind is something like Don Cheadle. 
Don Cheadle has a very archaic look to him that really, well, well, Don Cheadle's very, very modern. Homo erectus weren't that real non-modern. They really weren't. You get something like this, and I'm sorry to say it, but it looks very, I don't know, Patrick Ewing, but not, you know, but you get that effect. Now, the Don Cheadle form is looked as having rough hair or brash hair, but not knotted or with a Bantu type knots hair and stuff, but this one is shown to have had it very much and a more prognostic jaw, if you look at that, then we look at something like um, this, and here's another variation of it that shows something slightly different, but again, it still has quite a Negroid look to it, and they do like to put facial hair on this, which is not common in Negroids without admix, but apparently quite common in Caucasians, so, and, and, and other people, but Asians not so much, and Amerindians don't have actually have much of that either. So there's variations on a theme of what would be Homo erectus. You look at something like this, and this seems to be a Homo erectus. And this is a form found up in northern Asia, and what it would have somewhat looked like, and uh, actually two variations of the same, showing you uh, maybe like this or like that. And uh, in looking at that, you can see definitely a, a European or even Caucasianish type look to it there. And so you find contrast with that, with something like this, and it looks just uh, quite a bit different. And then we also have the Don Cheadle-ish type effect, too, that's there. And uh, a lot of variations on a theme, and I think that variations on a theme shows you that the Homo erectus, as we call it, uh, seemed to have been the creature that did the most variation in itself. That the ones that stayed deep in Africa had more prognathism, the ones that came out didn't, and so when we talk about prognathism, it's where, where your lower jaw sticks out much farther, and here's another version of Homo ergaster, and it shows you that it has that connection too also, and there's also somehow a missing link that is in the Negroids that is its own uh, Neanderthal uh, that they refer to as a ghost hominid because they can't, ref can't figure out exactly which one it is because of lack of DNA coming out of hominids. <coughs> and the reason they say hominid instead of a modern thing like they would, you know, Homo Neanderthal and Homo for, for uh, Caucasian people and Homo sapiens getting together, that the reason that they say it was more archaic and that it was a hominid type because it seems to have happened primordial to the point that they're proto even at this so it would have been something that would have been more of a hominid forms getting together that left some remnant in them as they stayed more of a homo erectus and came out of that. But it's just variations on a theme, and I think until we get you know more genetic data, we really can't get much uh, better than that of it, I guess you'd say. But uh, another variation on a theme. And what's odd about it, whenever you look at all these, I don't know if you see up here, it says, did laziness drive early relations, they have these things figured out now where these people didn't do much, that they never progressed, that they seemed to be fairly lazy, and instead of going and finding good flint rocks, they went with whatever they had and so on, and they said that laziness had led to the end of what would have been Homo erectus itself there. But yeah, so, kind of interesting, uh, and you, you know, so you look at the nasal slits I was talking about before, and this is what a Caucasian nasal slit looks like. In variation of the two. When we start to get to some of these primatic type things, you can tell they have a lot of prognathism to them. And a comparative analysis of this with a person with non prognathism with prognathism and how the variations of the theme go with that. And uh, I guess the variance in, in deference between them that you can find a modern, more Caucasian that's here, and then this right here is something that's very proto. You can tell by the head structure and the lack of a uh, even top of a cranium and things and how primordial this is and something that really may not even be attached to humanoids in any way but this is Australopithecus africanus and it's believed that might have played a portrayal in the part of what made up the ghost hominid that are in Negroids. Yep, so uh, uh, neat finding there but uh, some of the earliest race war uh, things that have ever been found I think that's kind of neat. Here's another, this is the picture I was trying to look for because somebody had actually done a arch rendition that looked pretty good. This now again shows you something what would have looked like more like the Negroid form 
of um, Homo erectus and uh, other forms of it up north seem to have this look to what you would portray one out of just by doing the simplistic uh, facial recreation of things and you get other ones like this this is Homo erectus demansoni and you can see its form too and how it almost has that a gorilloid or a hominid type appearance to it so quite a variation on a theme on what people call Homo erectus and I think that almost needs to be broken into separate classifications but I'm definitely not the guy that has the uh, finger on the book and gets to write things out or even perhaps even bring it up to these people but you see the difference here I guess in something simple as this uh, the modern Caucasian here versus what would have been Homo erectus and prognosticism as we see it. Um, maybe another shot at the difference of the two cranial forms and these craniometry people are pretty incredible it only takes a simple look at it and you can see something but again even in just this shot here here's your Patrick Ewing type if you will here's your John Cheelish type and uh, then we have other types that look almost like this and uh, so then we have Akala hmm? Is that a collar? <laughs> like, share, and subscribe, guys. More definitely coming down the pipe. We'll see y'all soon. Peace.